My name is Rachel Burke and our speakers today are Alex von Tunselman and Hugh Linehan. Alex is a historian and screenwriter and she is the author of five books on Cold War politics and cultural history, most recently Fallen Idols, 12 Statues That Made History. And Hugh Linehan is a cultural editor with the Irish Times. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Alex and Hugh. Thanks very much, Rachel, and thanks for inviting me along again to the Festival of History. It's always great to be a part of it. I look forward to us all being able to see each other in real space in the not too distant future. But I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, participating in this session today. And I, I can hardly think of a subject that's more, more pertinent for the festival because Alex's book, Fallen Idols, 12 Statues That Made, that made History, seems to me that uh, you couldn't really think of a contemporary political or social issue that it so crystallizes really the way in which there, there's no such thing as a settled history and that the way in which we navigate the present and the issues that we face in the present uh, involves a continuing reinterrogation of our relationship with the facts and the issues of the past. And, and nothing illustrates that more than the issues which she, she explores in the book. Alex, you're very welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Hugh. It's fantastic to be here. I only wish I was actually in Dublin. <laughs> Maybe yeah, next year. Hope, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully next time. Um, before we get into some of the, the detail of the book, I, I, I want to ask you about the, the choice you made, the overall choice to focus on, on statues. We know that a lot of the the contemporary issues in, in many countries, most prominently maybe in the United States, but many others as well, about uh, commemorations or monuments of the past. They can focus on a range of different things. They can the names of universities or buildings, streets, cities or mountains even, all those kind of things kind of start coming into question. I was, I was uh, looking at a news item last week about the, the Dutch royal family whose ceremonial carriage, I think, is just about to be retired to a museum because of some objectionable images on the side of it. But you focused on statues, representational, three-dimensional figures of 12 men. Why? Well, really, I kind of, I've written about statues before. I first wrote about them in about 2016 when there was a big fuss in the UK over the Cecil Rhodes statue at Oxford University and would that be removed? That issue has come up again since. Um, so I'd already kind of had them in my mind, but then really, of course, you know, last year when there we all were, pandemic, you know, in lockdown, and there were these huge protests after the death of George Floyd in the US, Black Lives Matter led protests. And of course, in Bristol in the UK, um, this rather famous now incident where a statue of Edward Colston, who was a philanthropist and also a slave trader, very much associated with the city. This statue had been controversial for a long time, and it was actually by a crowd taken off its plinth, carried to the harbour and thrown into the water. Um, it's a very, very dramatic incident. And really when that happened, there was all this kind of chat going on about what that meant and were they erasing history and was this, you know, just mob rule and a disaster or was it a legitimate protest? And I thought, actually, we really need a historical perspective on this. And then, of course, through those protests, more and more statues kept being taken down. None others in the UK were pulled down by a crowd. They were actually taken down by the relevant authorities. But around the world, lots were pulled down by groups, certainly in the US and so on. So it really kind of became a phenomenon. Um, and I thought, yeah, it would just be great to place this in a historical moment and really look at this because a lot of the discussion around it, I'm afraid, especially from politicians, was was pretty basic. So <laughs> I felt it was a discussion that needed a bit more thought. So let's think a little bit about um, the nature of the, the representational statue. Uh, we're all familiar with them, these men, almost always men, standing proud on the top of plinths while they if they're if they're writers they're sort of they're usually they got their on their chin like that they're thinking <laughs> about things or if they have some kind of military thing they may be sort of forging forwards they may even be on a horse um and i was i i your book caused me to think a bit about all these things and am i right in saying that um obviously they were very important in the roman classical period uh, and then they just weren't very important for a very, very long time. Maybe they were supplanted by religious iconography through the medieval into the Renaissance period. But then they had a big comeback uh, as secular expressions of, of state power or who's in charge. Where? Somewhere around the 18th century or something like that? Earlier than that. But yeah, I mean, well, no, actually kind of around then is about right. It, it's I mean, certainly in Europe the sort of statue phases have happened, as you say, I mean, kind of the Greeks and Romans really went in for it. So did the ancient Egyptians actually, so that's out of Europe, but you know, this kind of informed European culture. 
Um, Greeks really went for it and Greeks invented the word icon that meant statue and therefore that's where we get the word iconoclasm which is the breaking of statues which is obviously what we've seen lots of recently um, and also kind of the attacking of idols and so the Greeks sort of invented this as yeah you would have initially there were kind of figures that would be put up of some kind of noble individual admirable person so a secular figure um, and then, of course, you know, as people started making a bit of money, they just started putting them up whenever they felt like it, of whoever they liked. And something quite similar has recurred every time another wave of statuary has happened. So, yeah, there are there are there is a strong secular tradition of statues. And um, there are also, of course, as you say, um, religious statues. And that's often been a, a feature of history, too. And I think it's quite important to look at the boundary between the two because it's sometimes a bit blurred. And I think one of the reasons people get so upset about statues as opposed to other historical monuments, because there's lots of types of historical monument, seems like an obvious point, but it's an important one is that statues look like people. So when you see somebody with a massive hammer smashing in the face of a statue, that looks like an act of violence against a person much more than it does if they're smashing down an obelisk or a historical house which people do every single day in this country and in Ireland or anything else like that. Um, you know, it has an emotional connection. And that's also because you can see there's been a religious treatment of them in pretty much every culture around the world. At various points, statues are often used as icons. They're bathed, they are given offerings, they're sometimes, you know, clothed and so forth. So they're treated as sort of sacred objects in many religious cultures. And, and that, I think, feeds into how we understand secular statues as well. We do understand them as kind of a physical embodiment of a person's soul in a way. So they, they've got kind of tremendous power, I think, in our imaginations. And people I think this is why people get so upset about them, probably. Um, but yes, many, many ways of that, certainly in, you know, in Europe, we, yes, Greeks and Romans, and then a sort of long periods of, I mean, they still were making statues, but often sort of wooden ones, which weren't preserved, and then lots of religious ones. And of course, things like the English Reformation, of course, hundreds, thousands of statues that were religious were smashed up at that time, um, again, by the Puritans, um, and by, you know, Ireland's favourite, Oliver Cromwell, uh, getting well stuck in there. And, you know, I mean, lots of waves of this. And then, yeah, there was really a sort of revival kind of with the revival of the Renaissance, the rebirth of classical culture. Um, this tradition was re revived of making these secular statues. And then they really went to town in the Victorian era, 19th century. Yeah, and, and I think that's a really key point that you make in the book. There is, you describe a statue mania that happens in the second half of the 19th century, which perhaps not coincidentally also coincides with the peak of the European imperialist influence. Not coincidentally at all. Yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely, you know, very, very clear that this massive explosion in statues, I mean, and really, you know, I've got the numbers in the book and I'm now not going to be able to remember them precisely. But if you look at all the big European cities, if you look at Paris, Berlin, London, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mid 19th century, there are a handful of statues there's maybe kind of 10 or 12 in each of those cities by the time of the first world war there are hundreds in all of those cities so you can really see it's expanded and suddenly these statues are not just being made of you know kings or leaders they're being made of what are considered virtuous individuals so sometimes they're scientists or social reformers or all sorts of different people are being commemorated and of course politicians and so forth the great men of history and this really coincides with Thomas Carlyle's idea about history being the biography of great men, the great man theory of history. And I think we use men advisedly here because the vast majority of statues of this period are of white men. Um, if you look at Thomas Carlyle's book about the great men of history, he wrote exclusively about white men with one exception, a brown man, Muhammad. Other than that, all the men he looked at were white men. And so when I wrote my book, I very similarly picked a mix of almost entirely white men. Uh, there are two men of colour in there, um, but no women, because women were not really initially allowed in. Of course, these days that can be different, but that was that was very much statue culture at the time. We'll, we, we'll get to the Victorians and the imperialists in a minute, but maybe we start looking at a at a couple of your selections and start with 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 one of the earlier ones, and perhaps one of the slightly less well known ones, who is uh, the Duke of Cumberland. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, this kind of was interesting to me because I wanted to give an example of a Victorian sort of statue felling. Uh, the fact that this is not a new phenomenon, you know, the phenomenon of um, destroying statues is very, very nearly as old as the phenomenon of putting them up. Um, it's something that we see throughout history. Um, so the Duke of Cumberland now, if I was addressing an audience at a Scottish and True Festival, I would not have to explain a thing. But for those of us in Ireland and England and Wales now is kind of a name that has has indeed kind of somewhat been forgotten. 
So he was, he crucially led the kind of fight back to the Jacobite rebellion. Um, and the most notorious incident involving him was the Battle of Culloden, 1745, uh, when he took troops up to Scotland, Hanoverian troops, uh, English troops up to Scotland, British troops actually, um, and fought this coalition of Highlanders and French and so forth that was kind of supporting the Jacobite rebellion um, and carried out this really horrendous kind of massacres at Culloden um, where no quarter was given to survivors and where even you know civilians were also attacked um, by British soldiers at that time and you know at the time he was tremendously celebrated because really the news that was delivered back in London was that he'd won this glorious victory and actually it was said that all the atrocities had been carried out by the Highlanders and that was actually a reversal of what the true story was but what you see is early propaganda here you know this was a very deliberate reversal of the truth so he was greatly celebrated and Handel wrote songs to him and you know these statues started to go up and there was one in Burr in Ireland uh, then called Parsons Town um, and a great big one in London as well of him on a horse the one in London was uh was sort of rather unfortunate from the beginning because it was cast in it and Cumberland was a very large man and they put him on top of a very large horse and they put it in this square off Oxford Street and it was facing north so that it had its sword kind of way waved in the direction of Scotland you know in a very deliberate way but most people who entered that square Cavendish Square would come in from the south from Oxford Street so they would just see this sort of gigantic horse's backside with a sort of equally gigantic Cumberland backside atop it so it was rather mocked from the beginning but yeah by the time you know you skip a little later to Queen Victoria and of course the political climate has changed entirely Queen Victoria very pro-Scottish um, actually said that she considered herself a Jacobite and she was pretty horrified by this reputation of this kind of you know distant great uncle who now was seen as very politically incorrect in, in her time. So in fact, the Cumberland statue in London was taken down. Um, the one in Burr was also taken down. There's still a massive column in the middle of Burr with nothing on top of it because nobody can decide on anything else. Um, and she actually ordered the word Culloden to be erased from his memorial column um, in Windsor Great Park as well. So Queen Victoria, statue fella. Uh, <laughs> little do we know that she actually was at this herself. So, so yes, I mean, Cumberland, you know, as I say, was somebody who really went on a roller coaster of political reputation. And uh, certainly if you talk to anyone Scottish today has not recovered. I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it, reading that story? Because I, I think, I mean, obviously, of course, Queen Victoria, you know, had, had her views and was very attached to Scotland. One of the reasons she was very attached to Scotland was because the union was at the union between England and Scotland was at the core of her her kingdom and ultimately her her empire, I suppose, in a in a much more important way than it had been 150 years earlier. So in a way, this is uh, if we were to use modern language, this is an effacing or rewriting of history by the dominant establishment of the day. Absolutely, very deliberately so. And this is you know when we talk about the rewriting and writing of history, this is something that happens all the time. And you know when something that people say that statues pulling them down erases history, We're quite often putting a statue up is an attempt to erase history. It's an attempt to tell a very distinctive story. And certainly with Cumberland, that was part of the point, was this propaganda after Culloden to try and make it into this great British progressive victory and not tell the story about what we would now call war crimes or atrocities that were carried out there. So really taking that down, stopping this kind of worship of him kind of restored actually some of the historical truth. At that time, it then became much easier to talk about the massacre at Culloden, to talk about what had happened. Um, so, you know, we can see that actually it's quite complicated what statues represent in this. They don't represent history in a simplistic way. They represent historical memory, and that is whatever anyone tells you they want it to be. So let's turn to America, because I think America, I think we can agree, is where the current you know, the, the, the heat on, uh, around this issue began and continues argu arguably uh, to this day. And uh, the first uh, demolition or toppling of a statue in your book takes place in American, although it's not of an American, it's of George III. And I think you, you're at pains to point out that uh, a certain US president who is no longer in the White House um, uh, suggested that the removal of statues was in itself un-American. And so you very deliberately choose this particular incident relating to a statue of George III to prove him wrong. That's right, because that statue of George III, which used to stand in Bowling Green in New York, was in fact pulled down straight after George Washington read out the Declaration of Independence. So he read that out in New York, of course, 1776. Um, and a group of soldiers, sailors, some of the Sons of Liberty um, and 
various civilians went straight to Bowling Green and pulled down that statue. It was literally the opening act of the American War of Independence. So there is actually nothing more American than pulling down a statue. It is literally the foundational act of America straight after the Declaration of Independence was read out. Washington himself actually was quite annoyed by it. Um, he hadn't ordered it um, and he thought it, it, he didn't necessarily criticize the taking down of the statue. He didn't say what he felt about that, but he did say that he didn't like the want of order that you know these men were not following orders that they'd just gone and done it for themselves he thought that was a bit unruly so so we don't quite know how he felt about it but indeed um it is unquestionably a very very american story one of the things that's been happening in america certainly for me personally i would say in my own personal experience is that the debate and the controversy around the removal of particularly confederate statues over the last decade has um has forced me to educate myself in aspects of the history of the United States that I now realize that I didn't understand about the post-Civil War period, about Jim Crow and the American South, about the relationship between what became known as the lost cause of the Confederacy, a kind of revisionist sort of history of what had happened during the, the Civil War. And that statues are, the statues of the Confederate generals and leaders in the Southern states are absolutely right at the heart of that. Totally at the heart of it. And it's such an important story. And I think and it's, it's very distinctive, the story of the Confederacy and the memory of that, because people will always say to you, history is written by the victors. Well, in this case, it isn't. History is rewritten by the losers. It's very important to understand that this is quite different because the Confederacy, of course, lost the Civil War. We know this. Um, however, after that, many in the South were not happy to accept that particularly, of course, conservative white Southerners were not satisfied with the outcome of the Civil War, not satisfied with the end of slavery and with, you know, what was a disruption in their world. Um, and there started to be later on a kind of, you know, a real movement to honour what were seen as the heroes of the South, people like Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, Stonewall Jackson, these kind of big Confederate leaders and generals. Um, and this really began quite, I mean, the statue I look at in the book, which is in New Orleans, um, was in New Orleans, was a statue of Robert E. Lee. And that was one of the first to go up around 1870. But most of them went up much later than that. The big period of putting up Confederate statues was actually between 1900 and 1920. And that's very interesting because it's, of course, a long time after the end of the Civil War. It's, you know, there, by that time, there are not even very many veterans left. Um, the organizations running it are people called, you know, the sons and daughters of the Confederacy. They're not Confederate veterans themselves. So these aren't actually objects of their historical time. And the reason they go up at that time is that that was a period when really segregation was being heavily brought back in. As you say, what we call the Jim Crow laws, um, which in and of itself, is kind of a racist term, but you know these laws that were supposed to reintroduce segregation across the South um, and to oppress black people and install what they called at the time, because people will think that I'm being woke and modern and I'm not, they called white supremacy. This is the term they used. So installing that as a kind of a system again across the South went absolutely hand in hand with putting up huge numbers of Confederate statues that were supposed to look like the physical environment. They were supposed to remind everybody of who was considered superior and who was considered inferior. They were extremely political statements. This is also the time that the Ku Klux Klan gets going again, 1915, you know, around then. So these statues were an absolutely deliberate reminder to black citizens and to white citizens of how this world was supposed to look, of, of a, you know, a confederacy that was supposed to have won. Um, so when you see people now reacting to them and saying, you know, these are highly political and very distressing, the answer is yes, absolutely, they're intended to be. That was the entire purpose of them. Um, so the idea that that's politicizing history to attack them is kind of bizarre because they were politicizing history in the first place. And so those statues seem to me to fulfill a, a, a very particular function that not all statues do, but, but quite a few do. And we might talk in a little while about totalitarian states and the, 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 the function of statues in them. But these essentially Ku Klux Klan, white supremacist markers of power that went up in every town, village and city across these states, uh, sent a message to every citizen and probably particularly to the black populations of where their place was every day as they walk past them. Yeah, it's absolutely intentional. I mean, it's completely deliberate. And you can see it, I mean, for instance, on the Battle of Liberty Place monument in New Orleans, which was up, is now gone again, that's an obelisk. And, you know, that had gone up earlier, kind of in the late 19th century, but then in that period, in that kind of early 
20th century period, they actually chiseled an extra inscription on it, um, saying explicitly that this battle had saved our state for white supremacy. Um, actually, you know, like literally kind of putting those words on a monument. So it's incredibly deliberate. It's something that is, you know, absolutely conscious um, and organized by these kind of Southern organizations like the Sons and Daughters of the Confederacy. Now, at the same time, these people were also doing things like writing history books that painted the Confederacy in a great light, making sure those got into schools. They were doing a lot of political lobbying. Um, they were really kind of attacking memory from lots of different ways. And when we see things like culture wars now, this is very much something that was going on then. This was an absolutely deliberate attempt to revise history. And that's why we still have people now talking about things like the lost cause you mentioned. Well, this was, an argument that they invented, that um, the idea that actually southern states had just been interested in states' rights, that slavery was not really the point, that, you know, really it was a very romantic cause and it was all, to, you know, sort of very chivalrous and kind of invested in this very sort of fake European Arthurian notion of a chivalric society, and that really slavery was incidental. Now you can see that's nonsense. If you go back and look at things, you know, kind of the actual declarations of the states that joined the Confederacy, every pretty much all of them say that the reason they're doing it is slavery. That's just completely on the page. You don't have to interpret it or anything, but this was a deliberate rewriting. It was a deliberate restatement of a history. So, you know, you can really see that happening. Um, and so now, you know, we're still, still, we're dealing with a lot of people who've been brought up in a world where they've been taught that kind of quite misrepresented history and people trying to restore something a little bit closer to what actually happened. And of course, this causes great tension because people do tend to be nostalgic about the stories they were brought up with and they don't necessarily, you know, it, it takes a lot to unpick that kind of misinformation. And, you know, absolutely, if we talk about totalitarian states, you can see that happening in those too. So, the, I mean, the, the one of the counter arguments made, made to that by conservatives or people who wish to see those statues retained is what's called, I think, the slippery slope theory, which is that you get rid of, they came for Robert E. Lee, and next they came for George Washington, and next they came for Abraham Lincoln, and next they came for an inoffensive Irish Times journalist, and we're all going to be taken over <laughs> by this woke revolution. Um, and you do have um, George Washington in there. Because he is, to an extent, and I think you would argue um, quite, you know, quite reasonably, sort of next in the firing line because of his own personal history. Yeah, I mean, I deliberately sort of started and ended the book with him. You know, there's him reading out the Declaration of Independence, and then this statue of George III gets pulled down. And at the end of the book, I look at an incident in Portland, Oregon last year, where a statue of George Washington was pulled down. And a lot of Americans found that very troubling. You know, that's still a difficult story to approach. Now, Washington is controversial, particularly for two reasons that were extremely prominent in the Black Lives Matter and associated demonstrations. First of all, of course, he owned slaves and a very, very large number of them, um, you know, 300 or so slaves. And he and who he did not free during his lifetime. Um, and second of all, he, you know, is controversial for his various actions toward Native Americans, um, particularly in terms of, you know, increasing the kind of white land holdings at the expense of them. Now, in a sense, I think, you know, these, this is fascinating because those are part of what are the hot button issues now are kind of to do with indigenous people and native rights and also, you know, kind of the race issue. Um, you know, these are, uh, two of the really big issues motivating these protests in the US. And Washington, of course, has always been absolutely revered as the father of the nation. Although, as I show in the book, actually, that's been a complicated story as well. He certainly has been revered since the mid 19th century. Before then, there was a rather more ambivalent attitude. But from that point on, he was really like, and it's not an exaggeration to say deified. If you go and look in the Capitol building in America where he is painted on the roof, it, there is a giant painting called the Apotheosis of Washington, which literally means he is being shown becoming a god. So, you know, this has sort of happened. And then now if people are being asked to question that, a lot of people find that very, very difficult. I suppose what I would argue is just that what we have to, as historians, we're not sitting here with some balance sheet, you know, putting ticks in good or bad and trying to add up the weight of a person's soul from this. What we would look at is say, it is true that Washington, you know, was the founder of independence, had, you know, set up this democratic government, did not make himself a king, did all of these things which are extraordinary, and he owned slaves and, you know, the original kind of constitution of America excluded women, people of color, etc. 
and he drove out Native Americans and all of these things existed at once. So we're not kind of trying to balance those. We're trying to ask how and why did those things all exist at once? We're not trying to kind of get some moral judgment out of that. We're just trying to look at it and explain it. It, it, it's so interesting that story as so many of them are but, the, but 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 that one in in particular to me because it it reveals you reveal in the book and you mentioned it there the fact that the kind of the deification of the founding fathers in in contemporary american society was not always the case it wasn't the case as you say for for most of the 19th century so but because that has taken place this critique i suppose hits home harder and sharper to some of some of the people who who hold that view and of course, the other thing then, the other defense, which is which is made of a figure like Washington, which you you deal with in the book, is this idea that he was a man of his time and we should not judge his his actions or his deeds by our own contemporary 21st century standards. That that's uh, that that's unfair. Yes. Well, this comes up with a lot of the figures I look at, particularly people like Cecil Rhodes and so on, is this this idea about the man of his time. And this is a real bugbear of mine because. Actually, the crucial thing about these men, about people like, you know, I mean, and they're totally different, but somebody like Washington or somebody like Cecil Rhodes is that they were not normal. They were not men of their time and that they were some ordinary product of their period. These were exceptional people who were highly thoughtful people who had very evolved views that they had evolved themselves. And the idea that somehow they're just sort of a passive product of a time is kind of completely absurd. I mean, you know, we have to give these people the dignity of looking at them as individuals and not kind of as some just washed along by the tide. They weren't. Um, but also the problem with man of his time is that it assumes that phrase kind of assumes that somebody sums up the time. So everybody, you know, everybody in the 19th century was racist. Well, that's a very, very problematic assumption because first of all, we simply know it's not the case. First of all, lots of people in the 19th century were not white. So the idea that they were all white supremacists is clearly not true. Um, you know, clearly there were actually lots of different opinions and why does some rich white guy get to represent his time? Well, you know, perhaps a black person who's enslaved does not. Should that person's opinion not be just as important? Is that not also a man of his time? Um, but also that we know that even lots of white people, for instance, didn't feel like that. Um, there were anti-racist, anti-slavery societies. There were all sorts of opinions. And actually, we also have to look at the gaps in the historical record. We actually don't know what a lot of working class people or women or anyone else felt about this kind of stuff because it simply wasn't recorded. So we don't have a clear picture of how the whole of society felt in any particular time. And in my opinion, it's highly dangerous to base your opinions of a period on the opinions of a very, very small selected group of highly privileged white men and to imagine that they represent everybody. They certainly don't now and nor did they then. I suppose that the, the question is that, 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 that some people make that argument would say, but this is an argument for destruction. You're destroying things. You're, and as you say, because these are figurative representations of human beings, it often looks like you're murdering them or you're hurting them, or you're knocking them down or all those, those kinds of things. But I get the impression from your book and my own opinion as well, that there is, there's a theory in, in economics called creative destruction. And that something like that also applies in this instance as well, that this has to happen and the catharsis that comes with it and what it represents to the, to, to the population as a whole in terms of social change being ongoing is a very important act in its own right. It's a, it's a form of creativity. It, it certainly can be. And I mean, I'm certainly not telling everyone to knock all statues down. I think some statues are fantastic and should stay where they are. I think it's completely a case by case question. Um, but what I am saying is that I think we could have less anxiety about the fate of statues, because what we can see historically is that actually often it's been pretty important to people to treat them as symbols. So, you know, almost everybody will have some statue that they are pretty sure should have been knocked down. So at the moment, you know, the kind of culture war setup that we have, you know, at the moment is that there's a kind of general theme that all kind of you know older conservatives will be for keeping all the statues up and younger progressives want to knock them all down but actually that's very frequently not the case I mean, even if you just go back to the wild old days of 2015 ukraine when you know all the lenin statues in ukraine were taken down at that time those positions were reversed you found that a lot of older conservatives were actually enormously in favor of lenin being taken down and some younger progressives were not actually sure how to feel about that so what we can see immediately is that whether you support a statue staying up or going down absolutely depends on how you feel about that statue. It's not some kind of neutral question about history or heritage. It's very much related to that. And I mean, 
I certainly think a lot of conservatives were rejoicing at the end of communism when you saw those huge statues come crashing down, you know, of Zazinski and Stalin, Lenin and so on. I mean, actually, a lot of the Stalin ones went much earlier. But, you know, this... The statue, it, you know, it really does kind of depend on the situation. I mean, Saddam Hussein as well. Again, you had a lot of right wingers cheering when that statue came down. So it's very contextual. Um, and my feeling is that, you know, it's statues are they occupy a complex position because they're not quite sculpture. Sculpture and statuary are slightly different. So sculpture, obviously, is sort of an artistic purpose. Statuary is quite often propaganda. Now, I'm not going to pretend the line between those is clear as day. It's certainly blurry as heck. But it does mean that because they're political objects, they're objects of propaganda, people do respond to them as such. And you cannot be surprised that if people, you know, see something as an object of oppression, that they will respond to it in a certain way. And I certainly, I mean, for instance, the place in the world that currently, I believe, it's hard to say, has the highest density of statues is North Korea. There are probably thousands of statues of various Kims, you know, the dynasty of Kims all across North Korea. And now people have tried to reconstruct how many from uh, Google Earth and so on. But of course, it's very hard to do. And we can't see remotely how many there are indoors, even outdoors. There are thousands and thousands of them. Now, I highly doubt if some of those come crashing down, you know, at some point that you will see lots of people clucking about the history and heritage being so important in keeping all of these things. I think an awful lot of people will be cheering that on. And this shows us exactly that, again, it is completely dependent on who are they statues of and what do those statues mean? Um, I mean, I see some questions coming in and I'll get them to a moment. And one of them I just mentioned is about pointing out the statue of Queen Victoria, which used to be in Dublin in front of Leinster House and what happened with that. that that's a statue which, which isn't of a man. But I do want to touch on this layer of masculinity and how our understanding of that has changed and how that might affect things. Because very often these statues look somewhat ridiculous to me now and I, I suspect to other people too and there is a real there's a running desire through several of your examples to sort of assert um, a sort of a powerful in some cases extremely phallic uh, masculinity so Stalin was only five foot four but he certainly wasn't five foot four in any of his statues or the, the dictator of the Dominican Republic the other one who I really wasn't familiar with at all before reading the book he had he was really making a point about himself in the way he monumentalized himself wasn't he he was I mean Rafael Trujillo you know who who would be so sad that he wasn't wider known now he did try um is you know so I, I wanted to put him in because first of all you know it's interesting to have a kind of example from Latin America a kind of different culture again but also because he was so fascinating in that he was really obsessed with building monuments that that did not only project his you know great achievements the IIR that he thought he had as a dictator but also particularly his sexual power which he was very invested in um many of you you know some of you may well have read the novel the feast of the goat by Mario Vargas Llosa which is about him and that you know he was known as the goat because of his sexual appetite so he was particularly concerned to build monuments to himself that projected this so there's a lot of amazingly phallic big white columns. And you know, I mean, a big white column is inherently quite phallic, but all I can tell you is that these are so anatomically detailed that really there is no mistaking them for anything other than what they are. Um, the uh, Monumento a la Paz de Trujillo, which is the one I've talked about particularly in the book, um, is kind of, is shaped with an enormous bulb on top with an angel sort of spurting out of it in the most extraordinary fashion. I mean, and this could be seen from miles around and then he put a huge statue of himself in front of that. And really nobody was in any doubt as to what this meant. Um, it was extremely clear. So yes, I mean, it, it, an extremely hyper-masculine object, um, absolutely obsessed with this sort of phallic power. But I think whenever you see somebody atop a giant column or so forth, there is something going on, perhaps not quite as explicit as Trujillo. I mean, speaking of columns, there un unfortunately there are no there are no direct Irish examples in in your book. Although um, Burr County Offaly does make a uh, does make an appearance in the in the Cumberland chapter. But I mean, we have our own history with statues. Uh, there's one across the road from me here of Sean Russell, former IRA man uh, who died in a U boat, and he's had his head chopped off a couple of times, and he's been vandalised a couple of times. But I suppose the best known one that came down in Ireland was Nelson Pillar. Uh, in uh, blown up in 1966, um, fairly phallic in its own right. Um, did did it ever have a, any chance of making the book? It did. I actually, this is the one that is kind of my sad 13th statue that I really did quite want to get Nelson's pillar in, but I'm afraid because you Irish already had half of the Cumberland chapter and. Queen Victoria is in there, the one from George Street. Um, as a brief mention, I'm afraid 
you got the chop because Latin America had to have Trujillo in there. So, so you Ouch. know, a whole continent took the took the <laughs> took the place of Nelson's Pillar. But it's such a good story. So, if I do a volume two, it'll be in. I mean, Nelson. So, Nelson's Pillar was, of course, this gigantic Nelson statue on this enormous column um, in what's now O'Connell Street in Dublin. Went up in eighteen oh eight to eighteen oh nine. Um, and actually, discussions about removing that started really early on. I think the first discussion to remove that was 1876. So actually, a long time before even, um, you know, before 1922, years, decades, decades before then. Um, Easter Rising, of course, 1916. Now there was a standoff, you know, the final standoff, the kind of big thing was in, was in O'Connell Street right outside that statue. And actually, it had some bullet holes in its face after that. Um, but it kind of there was there was a fairly sluggish movement to try and take that statue down after 1922. There were talks about it or maybe replacing Nelson. There were some ideas to replace him uh, with either Wolf Tone, uh, St. Patrick or the Virgin Mary uh, were three candidates put forward to. Oh, put all three, top. I say, would have been a good idea. I mean, why not? Like the three graces, absolutely just up there. Yes. Um, but no, it was, you know, that was there, were, there was all this talk, but it didn't happen. And then indeed, 8th of March, 1966, of course, the Golden Jubilee of the Easter Rising. Um, there was a, this massive explosion. Um, Fintan O'Toole's just written about this in his new book because he heard it as a child. And it's, you know, I mean, I'm sure maybe some people listening today will remember it happening. Um, and of course, the top of it was sort of blown off, um, probably by the IRA. And of course, this was a long time before the kind of, you know, real bombing campaign in Dublin started. So actually, people were kind of rejoicing about it. There was a lot of public laughter in the street. What was left was referred to as the stump which I think now that we've talked about the phallic nature of this, we might all, uh, the symbolic castration of the British Empire had occurred, you know, um, and actually there was a great deal of merriment about it. And of course the head then went missing. Um, somebody retrieved the head and then someone stole it. And then it kind of ended up uh, that that summer, it went into a fashion shoot. Uh, it turned up on stage with the Dubliners at the Gate Theatre. It kind of did this whole mystery tour. Um, and finally it came back. I think it's, I believe it's now in Dublin City Council Library. Um, so probably uh, go along go along and see it there <laughs> yes and, and of course that that space then remained vacant for many years and was only finally replaced you know almost 40 years later by uh, um, what is now called the spire um, mm -hmm. and so so this very representational very masculine very 19th century piece of statuary um, or monumental piece of statuary was replaced by this deliberately abstract whatever one may think of it and I'm not going to give my opinion on it, totally abstract thing which seemed deliberately to be rejecting all those notions of representation and it does seem in the you know as the 20th century went on and modernism took over from from classicism that just the whole idea of making a three-dimensional image of usually a man and sticking it up and stuff sort of went out of fashion didn't it it was restricted to waxworks and you know team <laughs> rides and and things like that <laughs> Yeah. But, but but they do still get made. We have a brand new one of Roger Casement out on uh, on the edge of Dublin Bay, and it's quite handsome looking. This Edwardian gentleman looking out across the sea. The sea, it seems quite popular so far. Yeah, it's quite good that one. I mean, but yes, it is. It's a funny thing. I mean, it's actually quite odd when you think about it. It is, as you say, sort of a bit like Madame Two Swords or something, just having like an effigy of a person. And I think, and that's something in the book that I do want people to think about is trying to move away from great man history. And that's why I'm not flying the flag for let's have loads more statues of women or people of colour. I mean, you know, great. But at the same time, you're not then challenging foundationally this great man theory of history, this idea that these great individuals make history. And I'm actually much more interested in the kind of monuments that are going up now that really do challenge that and present a very different view. So, I mean, you mentioned actually this, and look, whatever one thinks of it, it is trying to do something different. And I respect that. And I... I think similarly, in, I talk about the Stalin statue in Budapest that was taken down in 1956 and, you know, in the kind of great uprising against Stalinism that happened at that time it was knocked down. Amazing story. Um, and then after that, it went through various. They didn't try and put Stalin up again. They put up a little Lenin instead at ground level, a much smaller one. Um, and then after the communist period, that went as well. And what's gone up now is what I think is quite a brilliant monument, actually, which is kind of a whole it, it's a whole load of sort of steel pillars that form a kind of, they come together to form a point. And that's supposed to represent that 1956 uprising where you have lots of individuals coming together to form a great unstoppable force. And, you know, I think it's quite beautiful, but I also think that's a really powerful message. And perhaps, you know, we can think slightly beyond these great men when we're thinking about how we remember and commemorate history. I mean, I mentioned Casement, and it does strike me that Casement is a classic example who over the, the more than 100 years since his death, 
has gone through several different iterations in terms of what 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 different people think about him. He was smeared by the by the Black Diaries, which Irish nationalists refused to accept for years, and which were seen as completely unacceptable because they they showed that he was a he was a gay man. Um, and then he was rehabilitated. He was brought back to Ireland. Um, the fact that he was a gay man um, became not a problem anymore. But I wouldn't be totally astonished if in a few years time people wanted to see him taken down again because of the nature of the relationships that he had that are that are described in the Black Diaries. So he, in a way, he's a classic example of how these things are are never fixed. They're always moving. I mean, this is what you find. And I mean, there are lots of statues in the book that I found have gone up, come down, gone up again, come down again. You know that actually there can be quite a merry-go-round for these things, um, that it's certainly not consistent as to whether these things, you know, there isn't a kind of simple linear process if it goes up and comes down. There's, I mean, so for instance, one thing that has been happening in recent years is that Stalin statues, a few of them have gone back up um, in various parts of Russia and Georgia. So, you know, there might have been a time when none of us thought that would happen, but it has. Um, and actually, you find these stories are not fixed. Yes, people constantly have a new attitude. And maybe some of those, I mean, some of them have already come down again. One got blown up very quickly um, by by some members of the public. And, uh, and another one that is up has to be protected by very high walls. So clearly, they're still controversial. But yeah, these stories are constantly in flux. And every generation has a new opinion. So people who are now very distressed that some being taken down, I would say just wait a bit. You know, some of them will probably get back up again. Just who knows which ones? I mean, you, I mean, you, you mentioned Stalin there, and, and in a way, it seems to me that there's a there's a number of your examples that can be bracketed in the in the same area, which are really, uh, I mean, Kim, Kim Jong Un or the various other Kims don't make it in there, but Stalin's there, Saddam Hussein is there, Lenin is there. Stalin is there, I think, particularly because you choose the statue in Budapest. He's there as a symbol of occupation, which again is something that we in Ireland are 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 familiar with, and so he's taking down has a very national valence as well as a, a, a as well as a, 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 I suppose a change a change of who's in power but also a sense of throwing off the yoke of the oppressor absolutely i mean you know i've i've worked a fair bit on the 1956 uprising in hungary and particularly in budapest um again and it's very much nationalistic uh it's not even necessarily anti-communist quite a lot of communists joined it actually but it was very anti-stalinist and that was at a time when you know if you put it in the specific point in history when that happened it was just after khrushchev's secret speech where he actually admitted that stalinism had been over oppressive and bad and tried to roll that back and give people new freedoms but he mostly did that really in kind of the ussr itself the satellite states like hungary did not get those freedoms that Soviets were then having so they felt that very bitterly and there was you know um, just before the revolution kicked off in Hungary there was also kind of this angry moment in uh, Poland as well um, and then the Hungarians kind of rose up to to drive out they hoped this kind of Stalinist government um, and sadly it didn't work I mean it was happening literally exactly the same week as the Suez crisis so there was absolutely no help from Britain or America who were very distracted with dealing with that or with any European partners um, and Khrushchev just sent in overwhelming might of the Red Army with tanks and, you know, in some cases rather literally crushed that rebellion. Um, but nonetheless, it sort of stands as the first really great uh, uprising against um, Soviet control in the satellite states. And it was still sort of an extraordinary story. Um, and I think, you know, the statue of Stalin was it was their first demand. And the first thing they did was to take down that statue, the rebels. So clearly you can see how they felt it was an important symbol. And again, you know, this is a point that I think is important to make is that what you find when people get very obsessed with taking statues down, that's usually in response to a regime that has been very obsessed with putting statues up. So you can certainly see that with Stalinism. You can certainly see that with the Confederacy. Um, and you can also see it with things like the French Revolution, uh, taking down statues of the French kings at that time. Um, that the, they're responding to a regime that puts statues up. And again, this may well be one day the case in North Korea. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Let's hope so. Um, <laughs> there, there's, I um, hope they're not listening. Uh, there is, there's a lot of questions coming in. So I've only got about 10 minutes left. So we'll try and get through a few of them if we can. One, one listener asked, this is an interesting one, Alex. From your research or your personal experience, are there any statues, fallen, fallen or otherwise, that really moved you, either for good or for bad? For example, this questioner says, I was really overawed by the giant Motherland statue in Volgograd in Russia. 
No, oh, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, the really big ones are extraordinary. They really do kind of do something, although there are some really bad big ones as well. If you go to Moscow, uh, the massive pizza that great statue they've got is so hideous it was supposed to be Christopher Columbus and then they the sculptor couldn't foist it on anywhere in America so he just changed its head and put it in Russia <laughs> and it's really bad and all the Muscovites hate it and want it removed but it's too big can't get it down but yeah I mean I think there are some that are really fabulous I mean and I I love sculpture and I love um a lot of statuary I think is really beautiful I mean I think if you want really transcendently brilliant um sculpture and statuary go and look at Bernini go and look at you know, um, I talk in the book a bit about the head of uh, Louis the Fourteenth, which is now it's in Versailles. Um, it has been, which is probably pretty much the apex of portrait statuary. It's absolutely extraordinary. It looks like it's in motion, and it actually, you know, some one art critic, Rob, uh, Rudolf Wittkower, wrote that it even has the sensation of colour, even though it's in white marble. It's kind of got this extraordinary movement to it, um, and I think it can be, you know absolutely incredibly artistically moving and there are some fantastic ones and I do think there are some monuments now that really do that I mean I love the Angel of the North for instance in in England um I think there are some wonderful ones around and certainly yes as 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 in moving me negatively yeah but there are certainly some that have made me laugh quite a lot I'll I'll tell you the uh there was a Melania Trump statue in Slovenia that went up a couple of years ago, uh, which is sort of, do Google it, it's really funny. It was kind of carved out of a bit of wood and sort of very lumpy um, and sort of roughly painted blue to look like her inauguration dress. And it was, I'm afraid the locals did not take to it um, and it was burned down quite quickly. But then the artist was really happy about it because he thought that all the statues being taken down and this made his piece somehow very relevant and current. So he was really pleased that it was burnt down um, and then he's made a new one out of uh, bronze which I think is even worse so you know you can certainly be moved to tears of joy or laughter by this that, stuff that, I mean that's really brilliant and it does strike me actually that um I mean it, it, there's a couple of things about that one is that pop culture and celebrity perhaps is the new the new frontier for statue around the world we certainly see it here in Ireland and of course it goes hand in hand very closely with kitsch I was in Limerick a couple of weeks ago and I came by accident upon a st the statue of Terry Wogan there, which <laughs> yes. I think is the worst statue I've ever seen in my whole life. I mean, the Cristiano Ronaldo one challenges it, but yeah, it's Ooh, definitely it's on, too, it's on yeah. the list, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, but then I think there are some really good ones. I mean, I think I really like, um, there's one of the Beatles in Liverpool um, where they're sort of, it's kind of in the front on the, um, down in the docks and it's the four of them completely at ground level totally life-size just walking along looking very very naturalistic and what I like about that is that they're not on some plinth or pedestal you can interact with them you know you can sling your arm around Ringo you can you know do little bunny ears behind George was as and I like that because it's much more humanizing I think it's you know ground level it's it's interactable with encourages your participation so I think that's that's quite a good one but yeah there are there are some absolute shockers around it must be said and, and of course, maybe the, the, the most famous celebrity statue to have been removed is Jimmy Savile's one. Yes. And again, that's an example that I use in the book as, you know, everybody thinks some statues should be taken down. Is that absolutely nobody argued for that statue to stay up or said anything about history or heritage. And quite rightly, too, because clearly that statue being up was in and of itself deeply upsetting and offensive um, and it had to go. But, you know, the point is that if that is possible to think about a statue, it's possible to think that's about any statue. So we do have to, you know, kind of interrogate these things as individual objects. Paul O'Driver in the audience is a little upset that you didn't find space for at least one woman and asked, could Queen Victoria and Leinster Lawn not have been included as a bit of a nod towards gender balance? Well, Queen Victoria does get a little look, actually. Um, but no, it's deliberately not gender balanced because statues are about great man theory of history. So I've actually deliberately unbalanced the gender because that is representative of the demographics of statues. Queen Victoria, though, you know, she does make a few cameos, I have to say. And there is this one. Yeah. So it was on George Street in Dublin, this kind of Queen Victoria statue. Um, and it was, I think it was the last royal statue to go up in Ireland, I think in about 1902 or something. I can't remember the exact date. Um, but it was there, it's sort of a massive great thing. Um, and James Joyce actually wrote about it. He, I'm afraid, referred to it as the old bitch. Um, and it was then sort of taken down, I think in 1948, eventually they kind of, you know, this is just too big and they shipped it out and put it in the garden of a hospital where it sort of sat with weeds growing over it and so forth until the 1980s when the Australian kind of mayor of Sydney decided he wanted a big statue to put in his central business district. Um, and he came across this Victoria statue discarded in Ireland and said that he wanted it. So, 
Then it went on a ship, um, like so many convicts of her time, to Australia. And this statue now stands in, in Sydney's Central Business District. So you can still see it there. It is originally Irish. So you sometimes find these things get shipped around as well. They do move, even though they're very, very large. Um, but yes, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Victoria does make, especially as well in the chapter on India, there are so many Victoria statues in India. But a point I make about them is that they're generally, they're quite hard to topple Victoria statues because, you know, when, with her giant skirts and she's often portrayed sitting down, she's sort of pyramid shaped and that's the hardest shape to knock over. So you can do it. They took one down recently in Canada, actually, and they did manage to knock it, knock it over, but it's really hard to knock her down. You need... Um, professional equipment generally or, or some sort of you know it helps if she's on a very high plinth um a, a number of our listeners point or our, our, our viewers point out that although although we got rid of victoria shipped her off to australia her consort prince albert still remains on the grounds of, of leinster house and maybe it's because he, he was seen as less offensive um uh, maybe because <laughs> most people who walk past him probably don't even know who he is at this point and that's maybe the, the solution to surviving if you're a statue yeah just stick a new head on him you know it'll be fine <laughs> Um, David McKenna asks, what does Alex think of the whole idea of contextualization by putting on additional plaques which carry information or whatever on a statue rather than removing it entirely? Well, I, mean, I think I'm very open to ideas of altering or changing statues. I think sometimes that can be fantastically creative. And I mean, some wonderful examples you can look up. I mean, for instance, in Ukraine, one of their Lenin statues, an artist actually turned it into Darth Vader. So he used fiberglass to make that big flowing coat into a cloak and then, you know, put the mask on him and everything is really good. You know, it looks amazing. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I'm actually very open to ideas of creative alteration. I think they can be very, very positive. Um, plaques, I'm less keen on. And the reason I can tell you is that I don't think they work in real life. I think what happens, I mean, so I can give you the example of, again, a Stalin statue. Now, amazingly, a Stalin statue went up in Bedford, Virginia, um, really quite recently, I think it was, I um, can't remember the exact date, but it was in the two, this millennium, in the 2000s. Um, and they put, the reason it went up was there was a series of busts of allied war leaders. So they had Truman, Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin. And they put a plaque on this statue saying, you know, by the way, he killed millions of people and was really bad. But nobody reads plaques. So what happened is actually everybody got incredibly upset. There was a really angry reaction. They had to take it down very, very quickly. Um, and it has never been seen again. It was simply removed. Um, and I think, you know, kind of in a way, kind of like little footnote on the bottom. Nobody reads footnotes. Nobody reads captions. Nobody reads plaques. It's it doesn't it, it's the least imaginative way to approach it. I do think in terms of context, it can be quite good to move statues. And I am quite into that. I mean, one solution that I think is wonderful that you've seen in lots of places around the world. This is the case in Budapest, actually, also in Moscow. Delhi, various places, is to create a, a sculpture garden or what's sometimes called a statue graveyard. So they move all the statues to one big place and they all sit there and they can be very higgledy-piggledy or they can be beautifully arranged. In Budapest, it's very beautiful and it's all very architecturally designed. And that allows you to see them in a different context. They're not lording it over you in a town. You're actually going to visit them in a park. And actually that can prompt some fantastic conversations about sculpture and history and culture and all these really, really interesting things. And people go there for a day out. I think that can be a great way to deal with statues that you don't necessarily want in your neighborhood anymore. You don't want them in your environment, but you also don't necessarily want to blow them up or destroy them. Um, so, so in terms of contextualising them in a different place, I think that's very, very positive. Where well, time is against us, but we, we, we didn't actually touch at all on what's been the most controversial removal of a statue in the UK in the last couple of years, which of course is the, the Colston statue in, in Bristol, which was which was thrown into the sea. But uh, we don't plan to get into it, but Denise does ask that, she says Bristol Council has been asking the people of Bristol what they think should be done with the Colston statue and its empty pedestal. Now it has been pulled out of the harbour. What do you think? And more broadly, this question of what do you do with the with, with the empty space left behind? I think actually Bristol's done a really good job of dealing with that. Now, I will say that I think Bristol created the problem in many ways by dragging their feet for years. There were objections to that statue for about 100 years and they did absolutely nothing about it, um, apart from constantly hold up attempts to, there were lots of attempts to put plaques on it, for instance, um, and they, you know, they just kept foundering. But I would say now, since it's been taken down, they've done this really clever exhibit where they put it on its side and you know with all the placards and so on and that tells you the most extraordinary story about Bristol's history I think and and the culture of Bristol and the changing nature of that 
Well, as to what you do now, I mean, you know, there's already been one other statue went up there. Of course, Mark Quinn went and put up a statue of one of the Black Lives Matter protesters on there, and that was removed within 24 hours. That went very quickly indeed, a uh, statue of Jen Reed. Again, it's quite a beautiful statue, but, uh, you know, it wasn't authorised, so that went straight down again. Um, I think, you know, as I say, I mean, what I would really like us to do is look beyond great men, beyond great individuals at all, and think about ways that we can remember history that are more constructive and more involving. You know, statues are distant and didactic and they stand on, we know what it means to be put on a pedestal. They're up there for worship and glorification. You know, we can do much more exciting commemorations of history. We can have festivals, we can have events like this where we discuss history, we can keep it alive, participate, museums, exhibitions. There are great, great ways to remember history that aren't as kind of dull and didactic as another statue. So I really hope there'll be a creative approach. The book is called Fallen Idols, 12 Statues That Made History by Alex von Tunzelman. Alex, you're going to do another 12 or are you done with statues now? <laughs> I'd love to do another 12. If they'd let me, I'd be on it. OK, well, we, we will, everybody who reads this, I think, will want to see it, want to read about another 12 <laughs> as well. There it is there. It is an absolutely fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Go out and buy it now. It's published by Headline Books. Alex, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Thanks so much for coming.